right, so thank you very much for joining us um, today at this uh, um, episode of uh, Investors uh, Exchange and Exchanging Ideas with Investors is uh, uh, Richard Worrell, who is the head of EMEA Equity Trading at the Janus Anderson Investors. We got Simon Stewart, head of European Equity Trading at Capital Group, and we've got uh, Dermot Dunphy as Deputy Head of Equity Dealing at MNG. My name is Michele Troiani. I'm in charge of the relationship with investors uh, uh, for EMEA and APAC uh, at Borsa Italiana now. Uh, after a nice period at London Stock Exchange, we are in a group, we are in a transition phase. Um, we have been speaking with investors for many years, so ideally today the conversation will be informal and informative as we want uh, in front of uh, an nice espresso. So the first question, perhaps I'd like to address it to Dermot. Um, Dermot, how is the, the market structure evolving, uh, especially following, uh, you know, regulation, Brexit? Uh, um, what are your observations and how this is uh, affecting uh, your daily job? Thank you. And thank you very much for inviting me to come and chat with you um, today. Uh, I'll touch first on Brexit for us. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, there hasn't been too much of a change. Um, we've obviously had to, to make some changes for our funds, but in terms of liquidity and the concerns that we, we've seen in the press, the liquidity has moved to Europe, but it's still very accessible to us. So that's, um, that's a, a very positive thing for us. We, we haven't seen a detrimental move there. Uh, the the concerns that we have going forward are obviously to do with um, equivalents and share trading obligations, and we continue to monitor those and be prepared for that. Um, but we would caveat that we would expect our brokers to help us to facilitate uh, our ability to interact with any changes that, that come through. But we do continue to, to work very closely with the regulators and with our, um, our our buy side associations to to try and to work through this um, in terms of the changes that we've seen with regulation and how it impacts us on our, our day to day job um, I think the main thing we see is greater transparency and more importantly we're getting a lot more data uh, and with this data we can do a lot more analysis on the desk to help us to uh, get a better client outcome in the long run. And at the end of the day, that's uh, what, we're, what we're aiming for, to, to achieve the best outcome possible for our clients. Uh, I think that kind of sums up my, my points there. Absolutely. Simon, would you agree? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd echo a lot of Dermot's points. I mean, I think, you know, the, the key thing around it is when you look at a post-Brexit environment, it just it goes to show you how prepared I think the market was, um, which again, uh, you know, and us as an industry, we've seen this before with great regulatory changes, um, the, the the organization and the necessity that, you know, we've all spent around time, hours, financial sort of commitments to ensuring that we're ready for the, uh, for the go live date. I think that was there in its abundance um, across firms. You know, I would agree, you know, in terms of other other areas, as we sort of look forward and go, you know, you know, with with a wider scope, obviously equivalence is still very much on the, uh, you know, on the on the agenda. Although it feels like as every day passes, the likelihood of it, you know, uh, materializing is is diminishing. Um, I think just sort of other areas, the, the data point that Dermot raises is incredibly important. You know, transparency in the data that we're being able to obtain in this um, in a post brexit world i mean it's just it's it's adding more credence to our execution strategies in terms of how we're sort of thinking about things and the other thing which is key um you know yeah the reliance and the, the dialogue that we're having with the sell side you know and the exchanges alike in a post brexit world it's incredibly important um you know as as to, to ensure that we're right in terms of interpretation of rules and you know and obviously as things are as things are moving ahead so all in all it's been a it's it's been a very seamless transition thus far um i think the other thing is you know the expectation i think from all of us is there's going to be plenty more on deck um coming you know coming ahead you know there, there's a lot of stuff uh, there's a lot of stuff out there from a regulatory perspective Richard, maybe if I move, can move into you, um, Dermot uh, said an interesting thing, which is transparency. And uh, 
that bring me in mind uh, the FCA recent paper on uh, you know transparency being very correlated on to um, you know price reversion. Um, so the more transparent is a venue, the potentially the higher is uh, the um, the negative effect. Yeah, uh, the price impact. Yeah. Do you have any view on that? And what would you feel to say to kind of exchanges and the community? Yeah, I, I thought it was a really good paper. I mean, the FCA have done this a couple of times now. We've seen one on periodic auctions. We've seen one on high frequency trading. And they're quite interesting. They're very informative. And more importantly, they're evidence based. So we really like them, I guess, for the background of where this comes from and around the double volume caps from a buy side perspective, generally speaking, and particularly as Dermot said around data, we can run the data of these venues and we see fantastic performance. The midpoint liquidity in size saves us huge costs. So generally speaking, we're really, really really supportive of those venues but the question for the regulators is 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 potentially rightly is well how much dark pool activity disrupts and affects price discovery so i think what's really good here is is these guys have looked at it they've looked at the evidence and they've said actually and i mean the exact quote is uh, we find investors can reduce their execution costs by selecting venues such as dark pools. And that's the absolute key for us. We're, it's the better client outcome. So for us, incredibly supportive, very good paper, and it's evidence backed. The downside, I guess, of, of, of the report is that it only looks at the situation if there's dark caps or if there's not dark caps. And I guess what you could argue is that what we should be trying to look at is the evidence overall. So I would argue that you could test things potentially at a subset. So to play devil was advocate and to support the potentially a regulator's view of well hang on a minute if there's too much in the dark does that hamper price discovery let's actually test and say well hang on what's the right number the eight percent cap is arbitrary let's say go let's test the subset at six percent at ten percent at fourteen percent and see where the difference makes and i think that's kind of finding that balance and then that goes back to that data the evidence back decision my personal view is there shouldn't be caps anything that helps clients save money should be actively encouraged and the innovation but equally i i, I think we should have that evidence-based discussion as to what the right balance is Simon, you know, it, it reminds me the pilot uh, experiments in the US somehow and uh, capital being uh, you know, a US global firm. Uh, do you have any view on that? On uh, yeah. in general, the, the, the kind of balance, what is the right balance between transparency and, uh, and price impact? Yeah, I mean, I, I look, Rich is right what he says. I mean, you know, there's multiple ways in which you can sort of look at this kind of thing. And I, but I think, you know, from a paper, from an onset perspective, this is a great start. I mean, empirically, evidence based, you know, so, sort of support of, you know, of where we are with this. I think it's incredibly strong. Um, I don't think anything was surprising out of the report. I mean, I don't think anyone, you know, if you were sitting in any of our seats, none of us probably expected that based on what we see with the overall water of fall effect of in terms of how we access liquidity um, via whether it's algorithmically or you know or you know or via via our brokers um, but I guess the one thing that that you know that really sort of did did stand out to me was just you know the the evidence back nature of it I just thought you know and I thought it was incredibly strong and so I mean, the other thing I sort of took out of it as well when reading it you know the paper finds that the effects of dark trading and periodic um, auctions are very similar which I thought was, again, a very sort of compelling sort of statement. Um, like Rich said, I, I think, you know, when I read papers like this and I, and I view them, I just I think this is just overall very strong for where, you know, where our current market structure sits and where we're going forward and where we should be going forward. I just think this is this is definitely the work, you know, this resonates, I think, with so many of the market, whether it's buy, sell side or, you know, or even the venues. Um. Yeah, rem reminds me, uh, reminds me a, a lot on uh, you know how the market structure has evolved into Europe. Uh, um, the timing of the FCA paper is uh, perhaps uh, very interesting in terms of uh, as soon as the, they left the European Union and the ESMA construct in a way uh, they're ready to perhaps promote toward uh, uh, rightly or wrongly other European exchanges that or jurisdiction have been after. But uh, that's my personal <laughs> observation. <laughs> Go on, Richard. I see you smiling. <laughs> I, I don't need to say anything. I think my smile probably indicates the size doing the same. And uh, we're, we don't know, right? But it looks it looks fantastic timing, I have to say. Um, but good for them. Good for them. That's the debate. That's the debate. That's what we should be doing, having that debate, stimulating it and just, you know, sort of throwing these things out there and saying what's next, you know. 
yeah, what's next is uh, my next question, actually. So uh, in the US, the latest debate is very much on the retail trading and the payment for order flow as well, therefore, uh, which in Europe is banned, as you know. Um, now, do you think that on that front is Europe ahead or behind the United States? So um, we all welcome democratization of finance, uh, the, somehow the uh, retail being more actively engaged and informed on the, our markets and on our financial structure. But the, what do you think? I mean, uh, in terms of uh, payment for the flow, is uh, Europe ahead or behind? I, I think the simple answer is we're ahead. I think, as you as you said, it's banned. So in theory, we're well ahead. It's not something that we've got to worry about. As ever, I guess there's a bit of nuance there. I mean, one thing that quite intrigued me was I read in, in the FT a couple of weeks ago that there was a quote that said from, from ESMA that said, the payment for order flow model is almost certainly present in the EU, but at this stage, we don't have evidence concerning its use. So they're aware of it. So it's going to be a bit of a watch this space, but but to my mind, it's not as relevant here. One, one thing that has struck me from it, I guess, is that what I noticed was when I read the stories and when I looked at the trading, you've seen quite a lot of the business going off exchange there. So, I mean, the numbers vary between 40 and 50 percent. And that could be where the read across comes over here, because if I think about it, it's something that the regulators are looking at quite a lot and potentially rightly because they need to understand liquidity a little bit better. But if I think about where they're coming from, they might say, well, hang on, we need to look at what's going on off exchange here. So that could mean there's a little bit more pressure around things like frequent batch auctions, dark pools, potentially systematic internalizers. It may well be the, the, the regulator says, well, hang on a minute, systematic internalizers, that bilateral relationship, is that right? You know, I think it's one of these things that could that could happen. I mean, from our point of view, we would emphasize our complete support for for venues that offer price improvement and help us trade in size and innovate. Those are always the key things for us. So we're supportive. But I do think that's something that might come. I mean, one point that, again, a little bit related around off exchange trading that I think you could see is understanding whether it's addressable or not. That That's very important. And that's where I think the consolidated tape can come in. And I think the European Commission have generally been pretty supportive of that. I've put statements out. And I think from whether you're a retail and you're playing that or you're or you're an asset manager or whoever you are having that consolidated tape and that same overall liquidity picture, that fairness, that transparency that the guys touched on earlier, I think is really important. So I, I guess, look, let's support the consolidated tape that will help all of these things and that transparency considerably. Dermot, do you have a view on that kind of retail trading and uh, do you feel that you interact enough with the retail flow? Um, the retail trading is is wonderful flow for us, and we do, I think, in Europe have a much more interaction with it and much more accessibility to it. Um, as Richard made a point there, it's about addressable and unaddressable liquidity, which we see in the US. And, and in the US, where the the retail flow won't make it to the the institutional flow that's that's going to be up there against it that can be that can be quite tricky and uh, it's it has quite an effect on the algorithms that the brokers are using that they're developing because they'll tend to use a pov style algorithm and whilst they may have a, a five or ten percent pov you can take out 20 to 30 percent of the volume that's being printed on the tape is not accessible so it can actually make it uh, difficult and you can therefore have a bigger impact with your order um, when you're using these algorithms you need to be very very aware of it and work closely with your brokers to ensure that you're using the best products and the right tools when you're doing that um, in europe uh, it's it's just a, a great asset for us to have. It's a, the, the retail investor is they're very intelligent, they're very wise, and they work well together. And they have a great understanding of their companies, um, and they can help build a good picture as to what's going on in the market for us as well. Um, the view that people are making, and it's a great source of liquidity at times. 
Yeah, I can mention that, uh, if I may, very quickly, that Borsa Italiana is, in fact, uh, extremely strong on the retail trading. We have a leading position across the European exchanges. Let's pair off the, with the fact that, you know, um, that it's a large uh, indebted country, public debt with very high private wealth, uh, and therefore uh, that tends to be invested uh, on the stock exchange as well, and very often directly. So the retail component for us, for most time, is very high and, and goes to the, um, you know, to double digits, uh, uh, pretty much uh, you know, on a constant base. Uh, Simon, if I can come back to you, going forward, uh, where do you see the exchanging exchanges, especially the European one? But exchanging, where do you think it would be helpful to innovate, especially maybe for um, investors? You mentioned a uh, few things, a very interesting uh, transparency data, um, reliability of the day of those data. Where do you think, what do you think, uh, you know, the exchanges should do? Yeah, I mean, again, I go back to sort of my original point. I think it's, you know, it comes down a lot to engagement. Um, understanding your client base, understanding your end user, um, you know. So I think some of the some of the best conversations we have are those, especially around the sort of quantitative, um, quantitative and empirical area, but understanding what we're looking for, understanding how we're measuring our own executions. You know, those are historically conversations we've generally had with our counterparts on the brokerage side, but I think it's incredibly important that the exchanges are having those kind of discussions with us now in terms of how we're thinking about venue evaluation. So I'd say that's the part, you know, that's the prime area. Look, technology plays a key part around this. It's in, it's you know it's imperative that you've got strong technology in terms of uh, being able to you know to sort of think about the, how these innovations and large innovations have obviously got to you know come from that kind of sort of you know technological enhancements. It's difficult for me to pinpoint any particular sort of idea that I've got at this point in terms of you know what's going to make things stronger. But certainly, like I think the important thing is you know when you speak to most sort of you know buy side firms, we're open to interact. Um, and engage, um, you know, whether it's at the concept stage or whether it's even, you know, even beyond that. I think that's absolutely critical. So it really does come down to a very simple sort of element just around around engagement. Um, and, you know, especially in a work from home environment, like a lot of us, uh, you can obviously, well, all of us on this uh, this call are sort of currently, um, you know, so I think that's, that's absolutely paramount that, um, you know, that engagement, that, that engagement is key. Um, and yeah, that's, 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 that's my sort of view around it. Richard. Yeah, I get. I guess uh, innovation. I think I mentioned innovation kind of in every in every one of my answers, and I, th I think that's kind of the key for how for how we think about things. So because we're trying to always bring it back to reducing reducing clients' costs and saving clients' money. So for for us, innovation, and I think Simon's right. The engagement that we have with exchanges, with venues, whoever it is, is crucially important. I mean, I talked about the FCA paper earlier, and I think you're an expert at a really good paper looking at the closing auction, which was called Better Trading on the Close. And I think one of the things I really liked in there was it said the cost of a trade representing 3% of average daily volume amounts to 3.7 bips when trading in the close versus 13.9 bips when trading in continuous. So if you consider that continuous trading is eight and a half hours versus the close of five or so minutes and, and it's over 75% of the volume, the innovation has to come at that continuous stage. I think that's where we've really got to find ways to innovate. For us, we quite like frequent batch auctions when we think of recent innovation innovation. I think what we had there, they offer a good balance of that auction functionality, which Euronext said works so well, but also the central limit order book process. And we find them good. But I think the more it, it's hard for me, I think as Simon said, it's hard to pick out one innovation because I guess if we could pick it out, it wouldn't be innovation. But I think absolutely right. Bring us bring us ideas, come to us with and I think anything you come to us with, I think we, we are always open with. So I think this this is why we're in this call today to have these dialogues with guys like you and um, to keep that engagement going. I can remark that uh, we are here as well uh, as exchange, both Euronext, London Exchange uh, in the past, but we are here as well to hear your feedback, uh, to listen and execute our innovation process. Uh, Dermot, uh, from your point of view, anything you would mention in terms of uh, where would you like the exchanges to innovate? What is that an exchange doesn't have that you would like an exchange to have? A, a, an incumbent exchange, obviously, which is the one I represent. Um, well, it's it's a difficult question because as, as the guys 
covered it so well if they were if they were innovations that we knew what we wanted then you'd be providing them um for us i think the the, the real thing that we're seeing a uh, good performance from is is uh, is the periodic auctions we're seeing good performance there from our data and again as, as simon and richard said it's the it's the data that we can draw and that then gives us the ability to question our brokers and by interacting with you and speaking directly with you we can build our knowledge pool so we can go out to quiz our brokers as to how our orders are going to market and how they're finding liquidity and it puts us in a much stronger position there to get a better client outcome um, you know our, our fiduciary duty is to get the best outcome for our clients so the more knowledge that we have the more understanding of how the market process works the better equipped we are to do that um, of, of late i've found the innovation towards the uh, trading at last has been very useful for us what well, that's been a good innovation um, and that's something we'd like to see uh, a little bit more progression on because it's a, a good opportunity sometimes to to access some good liquidity after the closing levels Dermot, you are such an elegant and humble gentleman. I recall when years ago we were innovating with the Block Discovery Group. So <laughs> uh, thank you very much. You have been an innovator uh, among uh, you know, all the others as well. Uh, look, um, I think we can finish up here with me highlighting the three probably um, things I learned today. Uh, the greatest, the, you know, the, from Simon, the engagement is key. Dermot, gr how greater transparency is being helpful uh, during all this time. And from Richard, how much uh, the innovation is uh, the key promoter to, uh, uh, you know, go ahead and uh, improve uh, market structure and exchanges. With this, uh, just the time for an espresso. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Simon, Richard, then. Thank you. Speak soon. Thanks Thank very you. much. That's Thank great. You. Thank you very much. Thank you.